Hello and welcome back to the podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, welcome. Hello. Um, I just started, you know, decided to put the podcast episodes on YouTube as well because I feel like different types of people are on there. If this is you, hello. Um, today we have such an interesting conversation. And, you know, if you've been in my world, For some time now, you know that I am currently 37 weeks pregnant, uh, taking time off work, and I'm just diving into things that I just love learning about and have been loving learning about for a long time. I just nerd out on a lot of things that I just find so fascinating, just knowing more about who we are, why we are the way that we are, our roots, why we came from the the narrative we came from, the families we came from, and what makes us, us. And a big topic that I think is very strong in the moment that I've not, maybe not in the moment, but I've heard of a lot in the last couple years in the healing, health, emotional, therapeutic industry is the idea of narcissism and I, he- I hear this being very u- used very lightly in general, and people just throw around this word. Like if they meet someone who's self-centered or what they consider selfish, automatically this person ends up being a narcissist. And I don't agree with that at all. And I think it's very important that we have the conversation of what it actually means to be a narcissist versus someone who's just emotionally immature and what that can look like. The more I started learning about this, the more I really saw and understood the differences and the more not only did it free me, but it gave me the opportunity to actually connect more to those people who are maybe just a little bit more emotionally mature if I choose to and give myself the space to not label other people so easily. Every single time I heard someone use you know, describing someone in my life as a narcissist right off the bat, I was like, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. And of course it can be the case where they are actually narcissists and, you know, you just have to kind of make peace with that and you have to really grieve that and feel that and understand that you've been in a relationship with someone of that sort for a long time. But at the same time, it's like, What if they weren't that and this whole time you're distancing yourself and you're cutting off communication or intimacy with this person just because of a label that you're assuming is that, but it might not be that. So today we're going to talk about what is a narcissist technically, what is an emotionally mature adult slash parent, what are the biggest differences, how can you tell We're also going to talk about the nervous system capacity. This is where I come in with my work because I just love putting pieces together like a little freaking puzzle and why it matters, including the effects on brain development and how it affects narcissists versus emotionally mature adults. We're going to talk about secure attachments, a little bit about trauma, um, and why is there so many emotionally immature adults in our world? So... Before we get started, if you are new here on the podcast or on YouTube, hello, my name is Natasha. I am a mentor for women. I specialize in somatics, mind, body, health, and wealth as well. So I very much love supporting women into understanding that everything they want to create, everything that they desire, all the change they want to see, it starts within. It is all in the roots of their body and just witnessing the women literally thrive off of their own supply and create changes from themselves. It's just so magical. So I'm very excited to be here today. And why am I talking about this specific topic? Because I'm not a therapist. This is not like my field of work. But again, as I had explained a little bit prior, It's because I have constantly found myself in positions where, again, the use of the word narcissist didn't feel good. Uh, When you really understand emotional intelligence, which obviously I dove so deep into that because of my own personal work, you start to understand and put pieces together as to why people are the way that they are. 
and you're able to see people for more of who they actually are and what actually happened to them for them to be this way. I think it's about like understanding also that these people, no matter what they are, like they just they didn't just end up like this, right? And I do think that understanding trauma and nervous system capacity and the body is very important to understand deeper layers of that. And also, I really do believe that we are here to upgrade the world, to be better humans, to do better than the last generation in the economy, in the way that we show up as humans, in the way that we work, in the way that we share, in the way that we um, heal ourselves and really choose to do different, right? Like, or else, like, what, what are we here for if we're not actually doing that in the first place? So in order to step into this next version of ourselves and the next version of the next generation, we have to do better and we have to understand the core of a lot of things, in my opinion. So I'm here to simplify things that I've learned years of in terms of, I mean, so many things, but the reason why today feels important is because I've, I've felt many, many times and I've ha- had very strong challenges in my life when it came to other people with their level of emotional immaturity or maturity and being stuck in the rabbit hole of potentially being involved with a narcissist and not really knowing what to do and how to label it and what that looks like. So buckle in. <laughs> we're going to get started. Um, we're going to do our best to just you know keep this at an hour max. But I really think this is going to support you into being able to point to be able to point it out in the future for yourself and to build the right toolbox to know how to handle different situations with people who are either emotionally mature or who are full on narcissists. And I want you to witness that when we especially talk about the emotional immaturity aspect, you might hear some things that you might think this might be you. And because when I went through that list and I really started diving deeper into what it looks like to actually be emotionally immature, not have an assumption or an awareness of what it looks like for me to be emotionally mature, I started seeing aspects of myself that I was like, oh, actually, I could work on this. Like, this could actually benefit me to be a little bit more, whatever, XYZ example came up. And I think it is important to just hear this with an open mind, not label yourself, not label other people, and just see what resonates you know, be the observer in the conversation, I think is really, really going to support you on many levels. Okay. Before we dive deep, if you are looking for direct support right now, something that you can get your hands on that is not expensive, that is very, you know, drastically going to support maybe your mental health or your body health or your emotional health, or maybe all three. I got tons of workshops that you can have access to right now. Literally, you go on the website, they're all there. We have everything from hormonal glow up, which really supports you to understand how your hormones work and how you can utilize your hormones that in a way that it can support your energy on a daily basis so that you can start living more cyclically the way that we're supposed to and that not get caught up in the burnout, in the hustle culture that is absolutely exhausting and knowing the gifts of each cycles that we're in and really understanding what it feels like to live from your heart and a regulated nervous system. That workshop alone is $50. It is so supportive. It's It has a bunch of somatic sessions in there too, meditation stuff. So it really brings you back into your your body. And we have other things that are a little bit more expansive, like the courageous path TCP. It's a 16 week self paced course that is all around mind, body, heart. We talk about conscious business, trauma, nervous system, ego, subconscious mind. We talk about emotions, how they run through the body. We talk about uh, monergy. So our relationship with money, it's literally just coming back into your own source and really allowing yourself to see the depths of yourself through that. So that course has been OG since day one. I think the first one we had was in 2017. And it's just been 
such a game changer to have access to on so many different levels. And there's also guest speaker conversations about intimacy. Then we have other ones uh, around, I think there's an extra bonus class um, of breath work and meditation. There's just so much in there. Okay. There's a lot. And then lastly, another one that we have is also energy. So restructuring a relationship with money is so important, especially as women. And it does start with understanding the energy of money internally and how it shows up and why we act the way that we act internally. Anyways, I can keep going on. If you want to get more access to it or just see what is out there, we have lots more. You can just click in the show notes or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down in the comments and go and check out what we have available for you. Um, All of these things I've poured my heart into and I just love to be able to support you guys with all the knowledge that I have over the years on so many different levels from healing myself from things nobody could figure out into changing my relationships into um, really supporting myself on every single level and ultimately living the life that I want to live like it's that simple like I'm never stuck you're never stuck we have choices we have opportunities we have things that we can change and it's just a matter of taking responsibility and doing something different and finding the right information that supports us and committing into doing the hard thing and showing up differently. All right. So narcissists and emotional immaturity and what that looks like. All right. So let's just describe first and foremost, what is a narcissist? And the biggest thing that we have to understand in terms of someone who is actually a narcissist is that it's a full on personality disorder and it needs diagnosis, meaning their brains are very much wired in a specific way where we're able to actually see full on that they are in fact a narcissist. Okay. It's not just an assumption. It's not just something that we may have in mind or something that we call someone just because we don't like the way that they're behaving. Our narcissist is full on a personality disorder and needs diagnosis It's something that has happened to them when they were kids. I mean, both emotionally mature people and both narcissists. It is a lot of trauma from their past, from their childhood that has created a lack of brain development and has impacted them to be a certain way. Okay. So the first thing that we have to really notice when it comes to a narcissist is their level of grandiosity. Okay. I hope I said this correctly. So their level of grandiosity is literally their over-exaggeration of who they are, their achievements, their talents, their success. Like they think they are the end-all be-all, like nobody can live up to them, basically. That is a big, big, big key point that narcissists have, okay? So just remember this as we go through the... um, the key differences between both. The next one is they have very interesting and in-depth fantasies of success, power, beauty, and love. So this individual often fantasizes about success, power, beauty, and love. And they may believe that they are so unique, like so special, again, connected to the grandiosity piece here. They literally are like the top of the top. They only associated with high status individuals and institutions like they have the best of the best of everything at all times no matter what okay there's a very strong need for admiration okay from others constantly looking for compliments constantly looking to be admired by the external world there's a strong sense of entitlement right all connected but yet all very slightly different very strong sense of entitlement, believing that they deserve special treatment and that others should cater to their needs and their desires above anything else. These narcissists also have very strong manipulative behavior that unfortunately, from what I've seen, from what I've learned, even though they may not say it's intentional, it is very much intentional and they know exactly what they're doing because Their identity and their way of being seen by the world is literally upheld by the power and their ability to control the people around them. So what I mean by this is that when they are using manipulative tactics and ways to control people around them to either, you know, be their friends or be submissive or, you know, whatever that is. In those moments of those really intense power dynamics, they get 
a high and they get that confirmation that they are in fact that person that is better than them, that is better than everybody else. And they're constantly manipulating these people intentionally to reaffirm how amazing they are, whatever that looks like. Okay. The biggest thing also with narcissists is that, you know, online, if you search about it, a lot of people will say that narcissists lack empathy. From what I've learned, narcissists, I actually believe, and I've actually seen, they have no ability to be empathetic. They literally don't have that framework in their brains, in their bodies to be able to be empathetic. They cannot understand and recognize how other people may feel according to their actions or their behaviors. They want to. Actually, I'm not even sure if they want to. I actually, I I don't even know, to be honest. But at this point, I just know for a fact, they don't have any ability to be empathetic at all and allow themselves to feel for others and what they're going through, aka this is why they're so good and why they are um, constantly using manipulative behavior, right? Like they don't feel sorry for these people. So that's a big thing that we have to remember. And another aspect that I find very interesting is they constantly, and again, this is all connected to each other, but they constantly believe that they're either always envious of others, they won't speak about it, but mostly they're very convinced that other people are are envious of them constantly. And I find that's very connected to the grandiosity piece, right? Like if they have this certain image of themselves of like the end all be all the best of the best of the best, then yeah, it's very, it's very normal that these humans will constantly think that other people are envious of them. So when you hear someone say, you know, oh, they were just jealous of me, or they're always jealous of me, or they want what I have, and no, 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 like things like that, those are little red flags to just kind of pay attention to, right? Um, there's, again, there's more to what a narcissist is. But these are big things that I wanted to point out that I think really make it a difference between someone who is emotionally immature. But these are these are the biggest things. And obviously, little things like they have massive high, high and high and low lows of emotions. They have tantrums. They're very defensive. They constantly blame others. X, Y, Z. OK, so that's one layer of it. So when it comes to personality traits of someone who's emotionally immature, let's go through a little list right now. <laughs> Take a sip of my coffee. Also, I tried recording this yesterday and I was like 40 minutes in and I was really excited about the whole conversation and my, the platform I was using to record it completely just shut down on me. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to do this tomorrow. Surprisingly enough, I was not even upset, but it was just like annoying. It was annoying in the moment. So I'm excited to be here now and to have the conversation and for it to actually record properly. All right. So personality traits that are associated to someone who's emotionally immature. And I want to preface the fact that this is someone who is ideally above 25 years old and who's an adult. Okay. And I'm saying this because we actually, I don't think enough of us realize and understand that our ability to be emotionally mature and our brains to be developed in a way where we're able to be emotionally mature actually like our brains are constantly developing and constantly um shifting and rewiring and it's not to say that you can't afterwards after this age but the biggest ways of development actually go up till 25 so someone who's still in their early 20s have the ability to still learn how to be more emotionally mature and again doesn't mean you can't change afterwards i'm just saying like some of the strongest brain developments happen up to 25 years old so this is emotional maturity. We're not talking about 12-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds. We're talking about like 25 and up, okay? So adults. Number one, they're very rigid and single-minded, okay? Self-explanatory. Next, low self-stress tolerance. So these people actually have very low capacity to be with commitments and responsibility because they assume of how, how much stress is going to involve. Uh, even just trouble admitting mistakes is very hard for them because 
they that's too stressful. It's like too much energy for them to be with and they get very defensive and blame others instead. So they actually don't really take much accountability for much or responsibility for much. And it's really hard for them. And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about why it's so hard for them to, to have this. Um, next is, this is very interesting actually, because especially with my background of being in the spiritual communities quite deeply for many years, uh, reading this and, and hearing this, I was like, Ooh, I wonder if this is all connected. So these people do what feels best in the now moment, meaning it's very hard for them to think about the potential consequences that comes later on with doing something different. Not to say that you have to be realistic and you can't think big, but I specifically remember reading this in the book, which I want to talk about after, but a lot of this is from the book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And in this book, when she was describing this piece, they do what feels best in the now moment, not really thinking about consequences later, is that these adults will usually choose the path, what she calls the path of least resistance and constantly all the time. And it's not to say that things have to be hard all the time, but it's about understanding that finding pleasure and effort in doing hard things and being an adult and not always, you know, we're not always going to do everything that we want 24 seven. Um, and you can find a way to have a better relationship with that. But at the same time, you know, if you're constantly choosing the path of least resistance, are you really growing? I'm not really sure. I don't really know. So all this to say, um, that that was definitely ringing a little flag in my mind uh, because it's a big thing that spiritual communities talk about of always choosing the path of least resistance. So next we have, they are subjective, not objective. Okay. How they're feeling is much more important than what is actually happening. AKA what is true doesn't mean, doesn't matter as much of what feels true. So let's say you're in an interaction with someone who's emotionally immature. And what happened is that, you know, they stumped their foot on the ground on, on a, on a root, on a piece of, of branch of wood of something. And they're, and they're really hurt and their big feelings come up and you're just kind of like, okay, like you're, it, you know, it's going to go away. You'll be fine. And in that moment, it's like, they might have a story that like, you don't care about their feelings or like you're insensitive and they're now more focused on their hurt and their pain of how insensitive you are versus just seeing the actual facts that, I don't know, this is a good example, but I'm just going with it. The actual facts that they just dumped their foot on the ground. It's going to go away. There's no blood. There's nothing happened. It's going to be fine. Doesn't mean anything about you being insensitive. It just is what it is kind of thing. It's not a big deal. Um, but I find that very important. It's, it's almost like they see red and they don't really understand what reality is and what feels true to them in terms of their reality in that moment is much more important than actually seeing what is the truth of what just happened and what is actually the reality behind what just happened. Okay. They are egocentric, same with narcissists. Okay. So this is a little bit different though, in the sense that these people constantly live in a state of insecurity, fearing they will be exposed as bad, inadequate, or unlovable. So their defenses are really, really high. I don't think narcissists have the fear of being exposed as anything because they don't have that aspect of themselves. They're Again, they're so attached to their grandiosity that they're not able to even think and fathom of the fact that someone might see them as bad or inadequate or unlovable, unlovable because they're literally convinced that they are like the best of the best. So that I think is a interesting difference. Like the egocentric aspect of it is different here. Um, but yeah, their defenses are very, very high. So if you are going through something and you're trying to explain to this person who's emotionally mature that what they did um, made you feel a certain way and that you weren't really okay with their behavior and they're super defensive, it's again, this, this part of their wall of protection that comes up that is trying to protect them because the, the biggest threat to them is to be seen as bad, as inadequate or unlovable. So you pointing that out could trigger those parts of them. Okay. So they are self-preoccupied and they're self-involved. So oh, this is a little sad when I read this, but like 
I've seen this a lot and it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So they have this fundamental doubt about their core worth as a human being. So they have to uphold this image, this self-esteem that they want to have about themselves. And that's why they have to be self-centered is because they have this core, um, this fundamental doubt about their core worth as a human to the point where their self-esteem arises and falls based on how others react to them. Yeah, that made me a little sad when I read that um, because it sucks to live in a world where you know, we're in relationship with people who subconsciously, this is subconscious, they don't even know that they're doing this, but they subconsciously literally question and doubt their core worth as a human. Youch. Next is they're self-referential, not self-reflective. So in all interactions that you're having with this emotionally immature person, all roads lead back to them. So even if you're trying to share something about yourself, they will constantly bring the conversation back to them using a lot of I language. So like, you know, they're hearing you go through something and they're like, oh yeah, well, I had this and I had that and I can understand because I did this and I did that and I went through this and yeah, so I get it, you know, but right off the bat, it's like a little invalidating because they're not really listening to you to listen to you and to be in connection with you. They're just trying to find pointers in your conversation in order to bring it back to themselves. So we, you know, if we're in a relationship with someone where they're, we're constantly feeling like, oh my God, it's always about her or it's always about him and it always bring it back to them. That's usually a little pointer of emotional maturity. Um, their need, their, they need to be the center of attention. Again, connected to the narcissism, um, there's a need to be the center of attention, especially in group settings. Next one is role reversal, which I think is very, very strong in emotional immaturity, especially emotionally immature adults and parents. Um, Role reversal is very big. And we see this in codependency is where basically they're, they're little kids, right? Like they didn't have the, the emotional support that they needed, the brain development that that they needed growing up. And then they have kids and depend on the kids for happiness and security and validation and worth. And they end up literally talking and being in a relationship with their kids in a way where the kids actually end up being the adult for their parent. And the parent finally gets validated in, in terms of who they are as the child. So it's very hard because these people can constantly use the cards of I'm the mother, but you're also my best friend and you understand me more than anyone. Kind of like this little guilt trip like they use. Um, it's not your job as a child to care for your, for your parents' emotions. Okay. They're adults. They're they're They should be having the emotional maturity for them to hold themselves, to navigate their emotions. Not to say that we can't be vulnerable in front of our kids. We absolutely can. I think it's the intention behind it. And at the same time, the, the, um, the roles that we play in those dynamics, like, you know, yeah, we don't want our kids to feel responsible for the reality of the adult. It's not fair. And even the child has no capacity to even do that because again, they're also emotionally immature because they're learning, they're growing, their brains are developing. It's just, it's very unfair. Um, and again, most of the stuff is just doing is being done unconsciously. Lastly, people who are emotionally immature are, they do have empathy, but very low. And they may say that they are empathetic, but you know, when you hear someone talk and they're like, oh, I feel so much for you. And you kind of feel something different from their bodies. Like, do you though? Like, do you really feel this? Or do you really have empathy for this person? We call this congruence, right? What what someone is saying and also portraying, like we feel that, we feel that genuine um, honesty from someone that's congruence. When someone speaks and says and does and feels the the same way, all in alignment with what is being said. So we hear a lot of words, but we then are like kind of wondering, like, is that really true? Because I'm not really feeling this from this person. Lack of congruence, lack of empathy, and obviously, which leads to them being emotionally insensitive. Um, They're very, we can label them very easily as sensitive beings because they're so reactive, but they're actually emotionally insensitive, which is very interesting. So 
those are the two aspects, uh, the two, the two um, categories of narcissists versus emotionally mature adults and uh, parents. And so the biggest things that I really see and I want you to remember in terms of the differences between the two, okay, is first of all, when it comes to emotional regulation, emotionally mature adults, all right, struggle to regulate their emotions effectively. They may have really intense temper tantrums, mood swings, difficulty managing stress and disappointment. Narcissists actually don't really have the ability to emotionally regulate at all. So for EIs, it's very challenging. For narcs, it's actually nearly impossible. (laughs) So it's just the difference in their brains and the way that their systems are set up. Okay. When it comes to self-centeredness, so EIs, again, emotionally immature, um, like narcissists, emotionally immature adults can be very self-centered, but their self-centeredness is typically a result of their emotional limitations rather than the grandiose, grandiose sense of self. So they're unable to, it's almost like the self-centeredness is a self-protection and an inability because they don't know how versus narcs actually are just like massively attached to their grandiosity. Okay. I hope that makes sense. The next one is their limited self-awareness. So the the EI, emotionally immature adults, individuals may lack self-awareness, but not to the same degree as narcs. They might recognize their emotional struggles and shortcomings and may be willing to work on them. So key word, right? They may be willing to work on them. So it's a limitation. When it comes to empathy, again, EIs have the ability to be empathetic, but it's very low, right? Because they, it's almost like they're unable to be empathetic for themselves and to allow themselves to feel emotions and to be with their emotions. So how could they possibly have the capacity for someone else, right? It's very low. Biggest difference with narcs is that narcs don't have empathy at all. Okay. It's almost like the river's dried up. Like there's nothing there. Um, it's not even a river because there's just nothing. (laughs) There's just nothing. And when it comes to growth potential, EIs are able to grow, even if that's like 1% a week or 1% a month or 1% a day. EIs have the ability to actually grow personally and self-improve and self-reflect. They have the ability. Narcs do not. Okay. Very interesting. And this is why it can be hard to like actually see and feel the difference between the two. But I hope this kind of cleared up. So again, all narcissists are emotionally immature, but not all emotionally immature adults are narcs. That I think is very important to to remember. So again, all narcissists are emotionally immature, but not all emotionally immature adults are narcs. Okay. So again, narcissist have this massive level of grandiosity. You have no empathy. And they are very intentional, intentionally manipulative, unlike emotionally immature adults, okay? Emotionally uh, immature adults are very self-centered. Their needs come first. Uh, responsibility and accountability is really hard for them. Super defensive. They can't take ownership. It was never my intention, blah, 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 that, all right? So when it comes to personality traits, and this is what I really love about learning in terms of Gabor Mate's work, is that... We're finding out more and more and more that our personality traits are actually different ways that we end up coping with who we think we are and what has happened to us in the past and the way that our attachment styles have been set up in our nervous systems. What I mean by this, (laughs) this is where like my nerdiness comes out here. What I mean by this is what we think may be us like, oh, this is just me. This is who I am. I can't change. That's false. That's not true. You are experiencing a personality trait that is here because of something that has happened in the past that has led you to do something different or to be someone different or to put up a certain mask or to do something specific so that you can still protect yourself and keep yourself safe based on things that have happened in the past that may have hurt. So example, If you hear someone, um, I'm thinking of someone in my life right now who uh, has a tendency of talking really, really, really loud and aggressive in your face. And she doesn't mean to, but she was not always like this. 
And when I ask her kindly, like, hey, can you kind of like tone it down a little bit? Like, you know, whatever way I say it, she's like, this is just who I am. And it's like, that's not true. I don't think that's true. I really don't think that that's who you are. Realistically, who you are at the core is who you were when you were a little kid, when you were like the most innocent self, right? The one who was pure still in the sense of not that to say that you're not pure now, but like we didn't have a lot of shit happen to us just yet, basically. And we didn't have all these things that led us to becoming these, these people over time. And she was very quiet and she was very calm and didn't feel the need to have a loud presence all the time everywhere, right? Like there's a reason why we do these things subconsciously. And so I think it's very easy to associate these, these personality traits of, of us Meaning, let's say you are a people pleaser or you're constantly procrastinating or maybe you tend to put other people first. Well, maybe it's not really because of who you are. Maybe it's just a coping mechanism according to things that you've done in the past that have triggered your nervous system to be in a certain way and therefore act this way. Meaning if you were to not people please, maybe you would have to defend yourself more, right? If you were to defend yourself more, maybe your nervous system doesn't know how to be in that state of fight or flight. So it freezes instead and fawns instead and ends up actually creating this coping mechanism of people pleasing because that your system thinks it's safer. But it doesn't mean you are a people pleaser. Just like anxiety, anxiety, you are not your anxiety. You are experiencing anxiety because of your nervous system that is having a certain reaction to something it's perceiving. I hope this makes sense so far. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because these personality traits when it comes to narcissism or emotionally immature people is that, again, when it comes, I, I do believe narcs have this fundamental way that their brains are wired because of what has happened to them in the past. It's very rare that you hear any story of a narc, someone or discovering a narc, where they don't have a really intense traumatic childhood. Something has happened to them to their nervous systems, to their brains, to their emotions, where they had no ability to cope with it in a healthy way. And their nervous systems ended up just being stuck in a certain state. And their brains did not receive the development it needed over time because of the trauma. All right. With emotionally immature people, the reason why we have so many emotionally immature adults, in my experience, in my personal belief, is that think about it like we are I'm a millennial whether I usually you know talk to a lot of people who are either millennial a little bit of gen x very minor gen z um but realistically we are the children of boomers of gen x of the ones who went through recession depressions and really hard times in in life and they did not get the proper support, nurturing, and love that they needed as children in order to have the proper brain development, in order to have healthy emotional maturity. So even with me, like I still remember how my parents told me that I was crying a lot when I was a baby and they did the method that back then was a thing to do of like, just put them in the room, let her cry herself out. Like, that's just what you do. But now we're seeing more than ever that's actually not the way to do it because I have no ability as a baby to regulate myself at all. I need an adult to help me regulate. And so a lot of our parents, a lot of the older generations never got the proper support, never got the proper help and nurturing and love to be able to have the proper brain development, the proper emotional maturity. And it all comes back down to their ability to have created a secure attachment to their families, to their parents. And even when we hear about secure attachment, and what that looks like, I can do a whole other podcast on this. And if you want that, please let me know, like either, you know, through an email, your expensive self or my email in the show notes, whatever that is, go scroll down. Let me know what resonated from this episode. And if you want to, to hear more 
about secure attachment, I often talk about it in multiple, multiple, multiple aspects of my work, whether it's the nervous system or money or relationships or communication or health, like everything comes back down to our ability to understand how to, how to have a secure attachment with ourselves. Actually, one of the biggest things that you can do for this is the reparented workshop. It's like a five hour workshop that you have to actually break down into two because it's so much information. And we also have a somatic session that goes with it in order to feel what it feels like to have a secure attachment in your body. I think it's like a hundred dollars. Okay. And you can keep it and you have access to it at all times. But in that workshop, we really go into restructuring what it would look like if you were to have a secure attachment since day one. Okay. This takes practice. It's not a, just a one, sh- one time deal. You go in, you go out. The women who have joined that workshop actually still tell me nearly nine months later that they still go back and they still do the exercises and they still um, take the time to go through father wounds, mother wounds, and to feel for themselves what that would look like for them. So it's not just like a one-stop shop thing. Okay. It's none of this work is it's a continuation. It's a progress. It's a journey. So all this the same that a lot of it has to do yes, with our nervous systems and the way that we are securely attached basically. And even when I hear about people talking about their, you know, um, their avoidant attachments or their anxious attachments or their disorganized attachments. If you want to learn more about this, I suggest to get the book attached. Um, it explains a lot about this, but even labeling ourselves in that state of like, oh yeah, I'm an avoidant. It's like, well, there's layers to this because actually different states of your nervous system will trigger different attachment styles. Meaning if you are in a flight or fight stage, you might be more anxious. If you are in a freeze or a fawn state in your nervous system, you might be more avoidant. So actually, I think it depends. But this thing that we do, I think we just want to like find the answer and feel good about the answer. So we like label ourselves and others and we're like, oh, that's what it is. Versus just being curious and thinking about the different possibilities that is here for us and what it could mean and seeing how it shows up. Anyways, so everything comes back down to our ability to be securely attached to ourselves and other people. And this does start the moment you're born, even in the womb, that's where it starts. And this is why like, I'm, you know, very much looking forward to seeing what it looks like to provide that secure attachment, that empathy, that level of sensitivity to my daughter um, that I've, I've, I just, it, to me, it's going to be amazing because most of our society is so emotionally immature and so did not get the brain development that they could have had simply because of the, their secure attachment and their attachment style when they were children. So if we can get back to that core and if we can get back to the root and we can do better for ourselves, because again, if I don't know how to have that secure attachment for myself, how could I possibly provide that for another human being? I can't. So it does start with me and knowing how to regulate myself and providing that for my children or my child at this point, who's not even born yet, but she's going to be born in a couple of weeks. And I really believe that this is how we get to shift the way that things have been and the way that we have been in generations in our world. And it really does come back into doing the courageous thing, learning how to regulate ourselves in a massively dysregulated world. Like this is the courageous thing to do. Again, this is like another reason why I named that 16 week self-paced course the courageous path, because it is the courageous thing to do, to do things differently, to be different, to choose how to regulate yourself beyond everything you've already learned and beyond all your programming, but beyond all that shit. I don't care what background you came from. You have the ability to change what you want about yourself and the way that you're operating today by doing the courageous thing and learning how to regulate yourself. So maybe this will be the next podcast how the fuck do you start regulating yourself in the body? And what does that look like? And what does it look like to even be dysregulated? Because I actually don't think many people know that they are dysregulated in the first place. You know, that saying that you can't really see the picture while you're in the frame. Most people have no idea they're, they're so dysregulated until they're regulated. 
And they're like, holy shit, I can't believe I've been living like this most of my life. And it's like, yeah, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome to who you actually are, where you don't have crazy thoughts and you're not super fucking defensive all the time and you can enjoy life and you are able to be um, extroverted or introverted or whatever story you have. Like, this is what's so fun about this work is that at the end, you end up seeing that all these things you thought were you were actually not you at all. They were just coping mechanisms and ways that you've trained your body and your body trained you to be just to keep you safer. Let's take a deep breath all together. <laughs> uh, and again, when it comes to your breath, I highly, highly, highly suggest to practice breathing into your diaphragm. So if you see yourself breathing like this, if you're watching the video on YouTube right now, if you see yourself breathing like this, you're actually not breathing properly. And I just lifted up my shoulders. So when you come, when it comes to a regulated breath, you want to inhale through your nose and you want to expand your diaphragm, your ribs, and bring the, the, the breath into your belly. I know it might sound confusing if you don't know what that feels like at first, but again, the more you practice it, the easier it gets. This is the power of somatic sessions that I have. If you want access to them, let me know, email me, I'll give them to you. But this is like the beautiful part of coming back into our bodies and regulating our nervous system is using something as simple as breath. So inhaling through the nose, expanding the ribs, expanding the belly, maybe holding the breath for a few seconds and then exhaling nice and slow through the mouth controlled. You don't want to just do these, you know, very aggressive breathing techniques. So... I hope this gave you the clarity that you were looking for in terms of understanding the difference between narcs and EIs and really giving yourself the space and the permission to, again, not label yourself, not label others, just being a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more spacious when it comes to this topic and a little bit more, yeah, just like, again, let's not go into these massive labels all the time so that we can feel safer in our experiencing uh, into understanding why certain people are the way that they are. Humans are complex and yet very simple. And I think it just starts with being open to seeing, that's my dog, Deuce, um, just open to seeing differences and different ways of being and interacting, really just understanding humans more in terms of who they are and why we are the way that we are, which begins at the core. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your energy. Thank you for your time. Your most valuable expensive asset that you have is your time and your energy. So I do not take it for granted. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please comment below into the, the YouTube spheres of what you enjoyed. If you have questions and if you want to learn more about something specific, please let me know what that is. I'm so happy to share more videos like this and podcast episodes like this. If you want more of the podcast, go on Spotify, iTunes, Fountain, and check out your expansive self, not expensive, expansive with an A. And you can also check out my other podcast with my partner and the love of my life, Jedi FM. And you can find that again, Spotify, Apple, iTunes. The latest episode we did was actually launched today, all about resetting your dopamine, what it looks like and how much it affects us, which is crazy to even think about because your dopamine levels are completely connected to your sense of motivation, of pleasure, of learning and connection, which is crazy. So a lot of people think that they have ADHD, depression, anxiety, whatever. And it's just because of their dopamine levels are off in their brain. That's it. So we talk about that for an hour, which is a great, great, great episode. Highly suggest to go and check it out. Um, if you want to connect with me deeper, I'm off social media right now, but my stuff is still up and running. You can send me a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I get back on in December of 2023. And if not, you can email me directly, finding it in the show notes. And I look forward to connecting with you guys more and doing more of these videos and these podcasts. And I will see you guys on the next one. Thanks for being here.